Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. So that works, okay. Um, so another year, another pleasure. Um, I recognize many faces here. That's quite surprising, but uh, it probably means that uh, I'm in the right room because there was a bit of a uh, exercise finding that room in the first place. Um, do you know of any people who probably didn't find the room? Because it's kind of hidden-ish, isn't it? No, yes, perhaps. No, okay. Well, we won't, we, you know, we stream anyway, so people... Sorry? Yeah, they'll watch the lecture. They will <laughs> watch the lecture again. By the way, if you are uh, missing out right now, we're in room S310, which is on the third level, and you just run through the fire doors until you get into an area which has a lot of uh, uh, glassed lecture rooms, and one of them is ours. Shall we leave the door open or close? What do you think? We leave it open for now, yeah. so perhaps more people will join us. So um, thanks for uh, making it here today, and uh, well, you know, thanks for having the motivation to take that course in the first place. So the graphics programming course has been running for a few years here already, uh, and usually uh, with changing uh, staffing, right? So uh, Simon is generally the mastermind behind the course, or, um, especially since it's uh, relevant for your game um, specialization. Um, on that note, how many people are here from the game specialization? Okay, pretty much everyone. Counter check, application. Yep, cool, sweet. Um, Good. Um, so that's the key focus here. But uh, we want to take it in a way so that we, um, you know, can use it for pretty much arbitrary uh, sort of applications, even though it has a twist to the gaming side, obviously. But um, that's something you can help us, uh, you know, shape and design as well. It's not uh, carved in stone this entire course. That's part of the reason. I'm obviously giving that for the first time here. And um, so uh, it may be quite different from what you have had in the past. Did anyone take this course in the past for whatever reason? Yeah? Okay, cool. Um, sweet. So, um, but anyway, so uh, let me know if I go, uh, you know, off the track or if you feel like uh, we are missing out on an important topic here. I'm not sure cool. I remember everything, but, uh, you know. Okay, we'll yeah. see. Up to now it's okay, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just checking, you know. Yeah. So, <laughs> things. Right. <laughs> Right, so um, just background, so uh, the core coordinator, coordinator is Simon for that course, uh, you know where he sits, um, feel free to annoy him, he has an email address as well. Um, so I'm Christopher Franz, I'm sitting in office A205, which is if you enter the ED department, so uh, big I R, um, the first door on the right basically, that's my office, uh, you can reach me by, by email obviously. Um, my usual area of research would be, uh, uh, or interest would be agent-based model and multi normative multi-agent system, but they have a relationship to graphics as well. We'll probably get back to that later. Um, the senior teaching assistants that we'll have in this course will be uh, Ahmed Kedir. Um, he's a um, PhD student and his specialization is in computer vision. So he will be largely responsible for some of the lab material that we'll be using in this course, since we are kind of overhauling this, this part in particular. And he'll probably also be giving some um, special lectures, special topic lectures on uh, areas of interest. Um, if you had the cloud course, if you had had the cloud course, which many of you did, as far as I can see, yeah. Oh, so that's the the only I had the cloud course. Oh. No, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I, 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 I gather who had the cloud course. Roughly, I'm just just oh. saying. If you hadn't, don't worry. But if you had, then you will know Petter as well because he was the teaching assistant in that course, right? So uh, he has a considerable background in uh, OpenGL. He took this course before, so he'll. If you don't correct me, he will correct me if I get it wrong in that course. And he has also background in other uh, graphics uh, um, frameworks that we may or may not touch up on, like Vulkan. But well, we'll see. Um, cool. Course material for lectures and labs will be on GitLab. That is our locally hosted GitLab, so not the um, official one, because we want to keep the resources contained and manageable. So um, you would need to sign up for um, GitLab, the anti new one, which would be prod.imdhic.no. Hic refers to the previous uh, Hochschule um, uh, domain, uh, but this is basically backing the, the, the GitLab um, 
uh, installation and uh, will provide or I'll provide the lectures and labs there because it's easier and more contained plus for you it's easy as well because you can check out everything in one go and you don't need to click around like crazy in Blackboard. Is anyone strongly proposing that we use Blackboard? Does anyone have a strong liking towards Blackboard? No? Okay. Rest? Yeah? Moderate? No? Okay. So because there's a lot of clicking there, yeah. I prefer typing. So, um, yeah? We'll be streaming this to YouTube. And yeah, I'm trying that. So okay. see, we will later see if that worked out. I suspect it does. <laughs> so I'm using the same approach. We have a new system here, but I haven't got my um, head around this entirely. So I went safe for now, especially since the whole layout is a bit, bit uh, foreign. Something we need to check if whether the lighting uh, is uh, not conflicting with the brightness of the screen. But um, that won't be too essential for, for this time around, I believe. Cool. So, um, so much about the, the raw dynamics of the course. Um, before I go into a bit more of the admin um, things, or admin details, I want you to tell me what the course is probably about. And obviously, uh, you read the course descriptor. Who has read the course descriptor? <laughs> yeah, cool. Good. So, then we have an open-ended set of expectations that you can now uh, no voice, basically, right? What do you think graphics programming should be about? And I'm asking this question, uh, question deliberately because I don't want you to be blindsided and forced into that descriptor thing because if you find something that you think is more relevant and interesting for you, you may just do that, right? So um, there will definitely be some core elements that we will uh, cover as described, but um, we, I also think we should have a considerable amount of freedom to move and uh, adjust to what, what you guys like because this course is a bit... Um, yeah, independence is a dangerous word, but it's um, loosely coupled with the rest of the curriculum. Because in the later courses, uh, like, like 360, for example, which we'll have in the third year, um, is um, generally you're more likely to use ready-made tools for game development, you know, like the uh, game engines you already know, and they often deal with the graphics for you. So in this course, we do it from scratch, so you understand, but most likely in your professional career, or even in your later uh, uh, years here, you will actually use tools to do that for you already. So we're kind of a bit flexible of how we want to maneuver that, right? So, of course, it doesn't mean that you don't program in any of the uh, tools we're learning here, so you may do that. I'm just saying you may not necessarily need to. So. Um, so what are your expectations for that course? Anyone? Yeah. Writing shaders in, for example, OpenGL. Cool. Yeah, OpenGL, shaders, sounds good. Yep. Course descriptor or <laughs> genuine interest? No, the... the, the, the expect. Uh, that was just something I expect us to do. Cool. Yeah. What else? Spot on anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I would actually like to learn some fancy shaders and such. Fancy shaders. Yeah, okay. special <laughs> shaders. You can, you can do a lot with shaders. <laughs> right. Yes, I believe. Right. <laughs> yes? Any other? Uh, draw a uh, teapot from, <laughs> from scratch. On the right, okay. Yes. <laughs> or, or a triangle. Or Let's so yeah. on screen. Okay, okay. Let's start with the square. Yeah. <laughs> we start with something with the simple ideas, right? So a white so square with a black square and a black background. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Black square and a black background. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I just put it all down. And so we actually know what we decided on. Um, let's see. Draw a teapot from scratch. Which teapot is he referring to? Does everyone know? Uh, the fundamental element of the universe, teapots. Okay. <laughs> right, uh, yes, a more uh, context specific definition of the teapot you're referring to. No. Um, Why a teapot? <laughs> it's usual, usually the, uh, like the first thing you get tasked to do in graphics courses. Okay. In the many first places. thing, are you sure? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. It, it has many it's of the elements. If you can do that, you can do a lot. Yeah. It's like uh, Hello World. Uh, uh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So to some extent, you're right. Um, just bring that up, the reference here, so yeah. just to clarify. Mm. It's like a standard test model for, for 3D modeling, basically, right? So called, referenced by the Utah teapot. I'll just bring that up briefly so we have a shared well. conception. And um, 
the idea is that <coughs> they basically uh, yeah, just use the, uh, the teapot as a, as a modeling construct because it has all the complexity that you generally uh, need to deal with in graphics, like you know, convex shape, complex shapes, um, and um, it's a good good way of assessing uh, you know the quality of a toolkit, for example, or yeah, perhaps your skill set as well. Anyway, it has be become pretty much the standard way of uh, a, a standard object uh, to to actually um, render and model in uh, OpenGL. You can actually buy the original one. I think it costs 35 euros or something. Um, so it still <laughs> still exists um, because it's a you know plain off the shelf uh, teapot. So no magic there. Um, what else? Teapot. Draw teapot, not Anything else? Yeah. The use of graphics cards. The use of graphics cards. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Graphics cards, I didn't expect that one. That's an interesting one. Sounds more like an engineering problem, but uh, we get there. Anyone else? Okay, creativity exhausted, too early in the year. Yeah. <laughs> Reflections. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, we're getting to the advanced stuff here. Reflections. Cool. What kind of, what are you thinking about when you say reflections? Reflection in water surfaces or in mirrors. Yeah, right. Any any surface, effectively, right? Any surface basically reflected to different extents, right? So, but yeah, that's another aspect to talk about. And lighting and shading. Yeah. You think lighting and shadows, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. like a light source. Yeah. And uh, uh, shading. Yeah. Uh, shadows. Uh, right. Cool. We'll need to do that as well. Yeah. Anyone else? No? Cool. Uh, do dangerous stuff that makes the computer go blue screen. Stuff that makes the I mean, there are so many games that do it, so you have to know why, you know why or how not to do it. So okay. we have to do it. Right. So of course, there will be a uh, yeah, professionalism element that we yeah, need to think about. Um, in fact, the, 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 the course, the way it's delivered here, uh, we'll, we're seeking slowly some sort of alignment with the Trondheim course because they have a similar course. Only difference is um, you're now second year bachelors, they're running on a master's level, so, um, which seems to be a common pattern. Um, but <laughs> we, 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 we try to have a more uniform interface with them, right? even though we have this divergence there. And uh, those were some of the aspects that we talked about as well, how to deal with uh, professionalism in graphics design and how to avoid dangerous stuff. So, um, cool. Any further thoughts, questions, worries? Yeah, please. Mathematics and uh, such things as uh, uh, geometry. Ah, cool. Yeah. So geometry, what do we need here in, in, in computer, uh, yeah, computer graphics? Vectors. Uh, Vectors again, right? So, but just continue. Uh, you were still sorry. Integral. Integral. Let's see. Now, can you send? Um, so there was uh, sines, cosines. Yeah. Do we need to do that all again? <laughs> you did this in math, right? Yeah, we did. But well, we'll still need it. Yeah, you need yeah. it, right? You done it. It's funny. <laughs> Quaternions. That's, yeah, good, that's, yeah, that's missing. That's something I wanted to hear, yeah, because definitely something we need to uh, yeah. talk about, right? Because did you guys have three maths in uh, your maths course? Three maths? Yeah. No, not much. Cool. Yeah. Uniformly yeah. know, or because I know they have different courses and they have changed over time, blah, blah, blah. So uh, some of you may have background, some not. But quaternions is one of those concepts which is fundamentally important for uh, graphics, right? So as opposed to uh, general geometry and so on. So cool. yeah, so that's something we will cover. Yep, that's by by definition part of the course. Cool. Anything exotic may come during the course if you're free to explore. So yep. Polygons and textures. Yeah, exact that stuff, right? So um, <coughs> probably somewhere here. What's the polygon? 
triangle. That it could be a polygon. Yeah, right. Well, this one, polygon, form of polygon. What other? What more general? What is the polygon? Not a two D shape. Yeah, yeah. You're getting close. A set of coordinates, basically. Yeah. What? Well, uh, what's the condition? The only condition that needs to be met with a set of coordinates. Straight line between vertices. Yeah. Straight line between the. Vertices. Yeah, between the vertices. Yeah. Bonus. Yes. Vertices. And what's the other condition? Which one of these are connected, uh, like to make to make a surface? Uh, yeah, and they yeah surface. So it implies that they uh, need to be completely connected, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah. Yeah, yeah. So okay, cool. Yeah, um, that's precisely right. So it can be anything. Could be a triangle. Yeah, you name it. Um, cool. Yeah, that's something we do. Good. Um, obviously, we don't necessarily want to. There was some um, idea. Post processing techniques like. Anti-aliasing and ah yeah exactly. Field. See how far we get with that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, good point. Post-processing is quite important indeed. Yeah, buffering, bump maps, materials, stuff like that. Sorry, bump maps. Ah yeah, okay, okay. Materials, yeah, materials is an interesting one. Um, that goes well with reflections, though, right? Yeah, it does. So, <coughs> okay, so I think we have a good collection here. You pretty much summed up the entire course. If every, everyone wants, uh, one of you wants to give a lecture on one of those, we're done. Um, <laughs> Volunteers? No? Yes? No? Okay. Um, just trying at least. Um, so the, the, um, those are the core elements of the, the course, obviously, we are covering. Who of you has some graphics background and what, to what extent and what does it entail? Okay. What does that mean? Um, I worked with it a little bit. With, with, with what particular? Um, Object 3. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any, anyone else? I've written some shaders in Unity. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, cool. All right. So, did you use the programmable pipeline of uh, OpenGL? Uh, yeah, but shaders. Yeah, okay. So, you, you, you did yeah. some shader development. Good. Cool. So, um, yes. So, we really start from scratch again, right? We, we assume the core assumption for this course here will be uh, C, I guess. And uh, from there we go, right? So um, everything else comes on top of it. But um, one element that we already discovered in the preparation for the course, the nasty of, of setting things up. So it's one of the things you need to do and learn as well. And along with this comes some element on uh, professionalism. Um, but um, we'll see that. So what I think is in the course or will be in the course will be obviously some introduction to graphics like terminology. We we'll talk a bit about this formats um, interestingly even picture formats which we talk about um, just to motivate one of the challenges that we're having in when we are uh, doing graphics programming and obviously um, briefly talk about frameworks then the theoretical foundations um, which is 3d maps you guys um, mentioned that before um, with core focus on matrix manipulations because they're quite important to um, um, have a you know uniform um, representation um, and the next thing is obviously uh, the tech. And the tech will be C++, OpenGL. OpenGL uh, version 4.3 onwards is the key idea um, that we're using. You guys will need to check that if your machines support that. I'm very confident they do. And if they don't, we'll probably get around it. So um, any concerns, comments? No? Does everyone have a computer, by the way? Not now, in general. <laughs> Right, right. Now I think there's a newer version now uh, that should actually work. So we um, still need to. Linux is always a bit of a fight. I can give you a bit of history. Um, while Linux is actually more convenient in setting up things because you can inst easily install packages and so on, as you guys know. Guys know. Um, the problem is they are that uh, oftentimes you don't have full access to the graphics drivers uh, or um, uh, only limited feature set, and those uh, uh, you know open source drivers are problematic. 
Um, we try to circumvent this, so that will be on Friday. We'll probably muck around with this and see that uh, we get all machines set up and have a reference set up that hopefully works for everyone. But for now, we want to keep it kind of open-ended, so we're suggesting, okay, you can use your Windows machine with Visual Studio, and you can use your Linux machine, and we hope that it all works. So, um, but there are some tricks and uh, uh, ways of getting around this particular problem, uh, which we talk about. Yes, but Linux should be supported as well. Yeah, that's as part of the course. Yeah, please. Um, uh, and like, yeah, that's good. Yeah, there were a problem with uh, using Linux and uh, virtual machines mm -hmm. for uh, when we did the, we started with 2D and went over to 3D. So the 3D stuff didn't work on virtual machines, so everybody had to install Linux on their computer. Yeah. So if you're using virtual machine, it might not work. That's right. Uh, so we can forget about virtual machines. Unfortunately, it will not work. So either native Linux or native Windows. But the idea is that we. Um, try to support both. I know in the last year, or years rather, um, they have um, forced people to go to Linux entirely, right? Because for simplicity, am I right or not? Uh, we started with everyone using Linux and later we, you could choose between, okay. between Windows as long as you manage it somehow. Manage to make it compile on Linux. Yeah. How about Mac? Do you support Mac? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a dominant fraction here, isn't it? <laughs> no, so far it's like on only two ones. Yeah, you guys need to figure it out for yourself. Okay. Well, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll find a way. I think it's a, it's a learning for everyone involved to some extent because you know things change constantly anyway. Um, but I talking about the dominating with care, dominating <laughs> platforms. Um, so that that was the primary concern. But I remember, for example, that um, um, one of the comments was that you need to deactivate safe boot in on your Linux machine in order to access to the graphics drivers graphics card was that something like that uh, no i yes? think somebody had problems with the so accessing someone had problems someone didn't so right right yeah exactly it was quite diverse there so um i remember that oh i i recall that from um from uh, the reports of past year um good yeah and then apart from that we obviously have uh, windows so visual studio meaning a lot of clicking um See how that goes because 2017 has changed a bit as well uh, compared to the older versions. But um, I think we have a baseline uh, setup going that's probably working out. So, um, but yeah, let's make that a lab problem. We'll deal with this and then we'll make our final decision how what's the proper direction to take. Uh, but virtual machines are out, so no point because they don't support 3D. So uh, we need to work on some sort of basic uh, um, uh, native platform. Sorry. So we'll talk about particularly the programming of the pipeline, which is one of the core features of uh, OpenGL, especially the more current versions, if you like. Um, we'll talk about shaders, textures, lighting, all the aspects you just basically mentioned. In fact, you are highlighted it quite well. In addition to that, we'll talk about um, object and asset handling, which is particularly important for you as uh, potential game developers. So where it's about managing you know, the models you actually want to display, which is not really a well, it's a kind of a graphics problem, but uh, it's not the, the, the core element of rendering is uh, um, a different one than managing your objects, right? Which is more um, relevant for your um, actual operation as uh, developers. And in addition to that one, we have some sort of, that's the idea at least, have some special topic lectures that go beyond the material that uh, we are actually covering and go towards the interesting uh, areas such as, for example, um, reflection of different materials, which we may or may not do, or some of you may pick up and others don't. So it, it's, uh, there's a bit of there's a lot of space for flexibility for you guys actually to go into a particular direction and say, yeah, I actually want to do a bit more focus on the game, you know, development aspect of it, and the other person may wants to fo want to focus more on the visual aspects of it. So um, we kind of want to try to manage those interests. But here is where you come in, where you guys actually tell uh, us um, what you want to talk more or hear more about. But I think it's easier to bring that up when um, Petra and um, Ahmed are here as well, so they, they, because they have uh, also a lot of insights that we can actually um, use, particular from computer vision in this uh, example. Um, what you will do in this course, um, well, basically it's quite straightforward. Two group projects, that's the key idea that you'll be doing as part of the course. They will be kind of extensive, so you spend a lot of time on, in, uh, on them. Because in the end, graphics is uh, 
uh, tricky in the sense that as soon as the things start working, your work actually starts. So, uh, you know, just getting some pictures is good, but usually it's like ugly like hell and doesn't make sense and things don't work as you expect, but you have a working, you know, seemingly working product, but only then the actual refinement starts. It's very unlike other programming courses where you basically um, have a result as soon as it kind of works. So then it's about polishing. Here it's really about uh, getting uh, the details right or introducing, you know, additional features that is lighting or shading or yeah, things like that. So um, don't underestimate uh, that effort. So two group, group, uh, group projects and no written exam, but actually a take home exam. So you guys have 72 hours to um, not do what you want, but do what we want. But um, to varying extents. So you get, will get a given task and need to figure out the resources, hopefully, you know, develop more skills beyond what you have learned in the course uh, and actually produce something, right? So a bit stressful probably, but feasible. So at least the idea is we want to keep it feasible. Um, know that many of those aspects are open-ended because there's, you know, there's no hard stop. Uh, you can always optimize or improve or whatever else. So it's really up to you how far you want to push it. Right, so um, that's a good way of exploring the material and the uh, technology. So it's, that's kind of really something that's uh, up to you. Um, yes, feedback we got from last year is um, whatever you do, start early. Don't do last minute, won't work out. Is that something that probably makes sense or? Uh, yes. Does work last minute work? I don't no, know. No, no. In some other no, it doesn't. In in some other courses, it works sometimes, right? You get away with this. Uh, in graphics, you um, yeah, it's it seems to be hard. So uh, be careful with this one. And the key thing is, if you have submissive, uh, make do submissions. We want to have. And that's the key thing about the applied computer science here. We want to have working programs, right? So not just giving me some code and hopefully it works or it's full of syntax errors. We probably don't spend too much more time marking that one, right? So rather, what I'm suggesting here. Use your already established professionalism and start simple and grow in complexity, but you have a working prototype that you grow, right? And if you use code versioning and all the other mechanisms you've learned about, uh, you know, issue tracking for your own purpose, for example, um, then you should be, it should always be easy for you to uh, return to a previous working version, right? Before you introduce additional bells and whistles that actually broke your application. So, uh, so much about this. Teamwork. This course, apart from this one here, yeah, just emphasis, <laughs> I, will, I will emphasize it again towards the end. But uh, apart from that, um, teamwork is quite important, right? So all the group projects will be uh, done in teams. So it would make sense for you to think about teams already. So it makes your life easier and mine as well. Um, so if, you know, we, we were not there yet, obviously, but it's probably worthwhile um, you know, g getting your group together with uh, whom you want to work. Um, of course, that it doesn't need to be fixed. If you feel like after first uh, pro um, assignment you wanted to switch, no big deal. Please. How large the groups be? Um, yeah, we wouldn't want to make them larger um, than two to three people generally. And the reason is mostly that if soon as you have three people, then get slowly uh, coordination problems. Um, in, in terms of, you know, who's doing what and people doing the run, redundant thing. But also there's another aspect which I got as feedback from last year. People specialized strongly and that can be pretty um, fatal for that one. So if you only focus on one particular aspect of graphics, right, you're really good at writing shaders, but you neglect the other rest, you're kind of screwed in the exam, right? So because you need to do everything, right? So it's why, it's why we don't want to push it and make the groups too large. You know, for example, cloud computing was easier to specialize, that was fine. Here it's a bit trickier to actually pull that off. Yep. And the home exam is uh, individual. Yes, individual, and but at home, right? So you have regular um, Git commits, so we can track your progress and so on. And of course, I mean, working individual doesn't mean you're not allowed to talk to anyone, right? So, but or you know, use the web at any time. That's it's, that's not the concern. But it's really un fundamentally individual work, right? So the code you produce is what you're responsible for. Right? So that's right. But we'll talk about this more once we uh, get closer to um, that one. So, um, thoughts, questions, worries, amendments? Oh, cool. Yep. Um, since, again, uh, we are in the Applied Computer Science program here, the, the idea is that there's a lot of secondary objectives attached to it. Yes, we learn about graphics, which is cool and it's hopefully fun. Um, but there's also other aspects that you want to take out of this course or take into future courses. 
uh, and you have seen that in earlier courses as well, it's always this element of um, focusing on professionalism. So uh, we're looking at code quality, um, so um, dealing with you know software requirements, how to manage them, for example. Um, also manage libraries, which will be a tricky bit, in particular with OpenGL, as we'll see, and setting up development machine and so on. So all those <laughs> things where um, you probably need to think about your way of documenting that either or automating part of this, uh, this one. So it's um, quite relevant to think about this. Um, and obviously documentation, and you guys said do dangerous stuff, that's probably along the lines of debugging. Um, how to figure out that we don't do dangerous stuff, or if things go um, sideways. So, but that shouldn't be news to you, so you guys have heard about this um, already before, I guess. So the general principle will be that on Monday we have more like a lecture kind of setup, and on Friday the labs, so it's um, really the idea of um, having this iteration as opposed to this interleaved approach that we did in uh, other courses, because there's a bit of theory going on here, and it's probably worthwhile to dedicate one slot just to talk about this. And obviously demand-based vary this one. Um, for example, if the lecture takes longer, then we can carry that over um, as well. Um, I would like to see interactive sessions, so you guys contributing more than I, for example, because you're way more people. Uh, yeah, so. Um, so it would be quite helpful, but also to steer the course direction, saying, yeah, okay, we heard enough about, enough about this, or what about this? Can we talk about this, right? So those are the kind of um, ideas we want to get here. And when I can still block you and say, nah, sorry, it's a bit too, um, too far uh, in, the, in, in a different direction. So um, this also extends to the assignments, right? The assignments will be set, so you will get, get given assignments with all proper uh, specifications and so on. But I think it may be worthwhile that you guys can have your own proposals for selected assignments. So you say, no, nah, I actually want to do something else. Either because you did some graphics programming already or, uh, or did the course already. Um, or want to really try something out uh, on your own. We just check if the complexity is equivalent to what you should have produced in the uh, given assignment. And then we know you can go ahead with this as well. So uh, think about this as well. If you have a kind of interesting project you want to carry out uh, and you find your uh, peers to do that, right? Again, teamwork. Um, then there shouldn't be any harm of proposing that as an alternative. Cool. Yeah, I think that's that admin stuff a bit, I guess, most of it. Um, right. With that in mind, um, I think it's time to start about uh, start with the actual course. So um, computer graphics. So that's the key idea. What we talk, what we'll be talking about for for coming upcoming weeks. Um, but the fundamental question: What's the key purpose? What's happening here? What's the key task that we are doing? Or rather, in graphics programming, what is the key purpose of that activity? We're using some information to display uh, something visual on the screen. Yeah, information. Yeah, like a text editor. This I mean, I mean, say for example, you have a texture. That's the information you have, and you're doing something to display that on the screen. Yeah. In some sort of fashion. Yeah. Cool. So it's about having something in displaying on the screen, right? So um, yeah. So let's let's if we um, so yeah let's say let's call this thing that we have application. It probably works well, right? So any sort of application basically. And um, then we want to actually display it on a screen. That's fundamentally the job that uh, graphics or computer graphics is uh, supposed to do. Let's suggest that we have a bit more of a complex uh, uh, model. For example, we have some, um, you know, 3D elements involved, um, hopefully. 2D initially, we start somewhere um, because uh, the same pattern applies still. Then we have some sort of application that represents some, you know, objects, cu cubes or squares, if you want to stay 2D, if you like. And um, the um, application generates some sort of uh, geometry, right, based on the polygons, as you guys mentioned, for example, um, before, that then are um, yeah, kind of um, filtered, but fundamentally they need to be modeled in a way so they can be um, displayed on a screen, which usually works on a grid-based layout, which is the conventional coordinates that we know, right? So uh, screen coordinates. And what's the general characteristics of displays Con in contrast to the potential models that we're dealing with? Well, the displays, uh, like pixels. Yeah. Resolution. 
Yeah. yeah, resolution is one of them. Yeah, we get to that. But more fundamental, if we look at uh, displays. There are arrays of pixels that you uh, empty out from a buffer onto the display. Yeah. Um, but but from a visual perspective, so what, what's the fundamental feature of, of the screen? The screen is flat. Exactly, right? So it's a 2D screen. So uh, we're dealing with 2D here. What are we dealing with here? 3D. Yeah, or 2D, right? So it could be both, right? So but, uh, fundamentally, it's a challenge of this course here. We have a 3D model that we navigate, that we uh, uh, change perspective on, that we have reflections bouncing off from. Uh, we have lighting shadows elements. And obviously, also our user perspective. And that we then need to rasterize. That means actually uh, reduce to a set of um, pixel definitions, and fundamentally then display on the screen. So that's all what we're doing. Uh, all we're doing. So it sounds simple, but it's actually quite a bit uh, something involved there. I guess uh, that we need to uh, be dealing with more more details. I found this slide, so I found it so nice that I thought I'd put it in here. Um, so fundamentally, you get a model from a database. That's where the asset management comes in. Either you write that model yourself. Um, then this model is either um, for, may exist already in the form of uh, polygons, so uh, coordinate definition or uh, vertex definitions that are then uh, connected to approximate some sort of surface that you're interested in modeling, right? So like a globe or I don't know, um, dice or whatever else. Um, then you obviously apply the, you have some lighting characteristics. So especially in 3D uh, case, you need to define um, the direction of the light and that will necessarily affect uh, in how far um, you know uh, what what um, is reflected from the particular object what shadows appear and so on so we deal with this one we have a different um, perspective from a, um, from the camera right so we have lights and camera so we need to organize those ones as well so we potentially need to transform the perspective of the model that we have uh, generated from the database so there'll be some uh, transformation elements involved, so it's where the beautiful quaternions come into play. And uh, then we actually need to crop out here, it's about pretty much about saving memory as well, uh, to actually re remove everything we can't see anyway from the screen because the models can be arbitrarily complex. And after this transformation, they may be, you know, partially overlapping with the screen or only partially visible. So then clipping happens, and only then we need to translate it to some sort of window, right? So into the, something that's displayed on a screen, either full screen or in a window, it doesn't matter at this stage, uh, but in a 2D um, representation. So those are basically all the steps that we need to do, or that any graphics engine needs to do, basically. Um, and that's the um, key idea of the course. So we walk through all those different steps with varying levels of details in all those, because I want to give you guys the space to explore um, some of them um, on your own in greater depth, for example, here, for example, here, it's different um, level of involvement on your side. The rest is rather um, well defined. So, cool. Um, so, yep. So, we figured that out. Um, so, there's this integration element. We need to integrate with conventional software. Screens only work in 2D, which is boring seemingly, but the actual scenes work in 3D, so we need to do a translation, which is fun, right? So, um, but we obviously have a lot of um, challenges we're dealing with, right? So what are aspects that influence the, uh, both the quality, but also our ability to um, do graphics? What are aspects? Think about what's in front of you. Do we all have the same graphics card in our machine? No. no. Rarely, right? So we don't even have the same machine, right? So we most likely have some uh, um, uh, challenges there. So the hardware is considerably different, right? So we have different hardware that involves the uh, platform. Um, also, more importantly, we need to think about mobile. No one mentioned that here. Is anyone interested in doing programming on mobile devices? Please say no, because we have a mobile course. <laughs> In fact, is anyone taking the mobile course this semester? Yes. Is that, is that a second or third year course, that one? The second year. Right, okay, cool. So you're setting the same course. Cool, because um, there will be some coverage of OpenGL ES. Um, yeah? It is a uh, third year course, but we have one taking the third year course. Okay, okay cool. Sweet. Okay, um, but so yeah, so there, there will be some overlap there when it comes to graphic processing. So I think some of the elements. <laughs> translate into that course as well. So, but uh, anyway, coming back to my point here, 
we have a vastly different hardware, right? Both in terms of performance, but also simply in uh, uh, drivers, um, um, resolution, or fundamentally technology that we're using, see at key displays, well, you know, forget about those ones, versus LCD or OLED displays that are uh, the more modern ones. Um, something that's we don't want to deal with because it's kind of a bit of a hardware engineering problem and we are kind of more on the software side of things, uh, on the programming side of things. Um, and secondly, obviously, software varies as well. We know already operating systems will vary. That's the nightmare of this course here. Um, it's probably the hardest bit in this entire course, getting that to work. Um, programming languages can vary, right? So you're free to write it pretty much uh, uh, applications, um, but specifically games in programming languages of your choice. Our choice is C++, so much about diversity. Um, so uh, we leave it at that. If, if, however, if any one of you wants to explore alternative, alternative routes, you know, and wants to, I don't know, try something out and perhaps even show it to the class, perhaps be cool. Um, some, some perhaps unorthodox choice of programming language. Um, but fundamentally is, uh, the, or the key challenge that we're dealing with, what's the biggest challenge you think we're dealing with um, in the whole graphics programming sphere? It's not a technical one to give you give it away. Money. <laughs> Money is good. <laughs> that's an economic one. Yep, that's that's good. I didn't list that. That's right. How much money do you have yet? How do you have at a <coughs> Defines how detailed you can uh, go. Right. That's a good point. Money in your as a student in your case it means time. Right. How much time do you invest to actually get you know how far to get how many features to exploit. Right. In the economic world, that translate then into money. Um, but no, well, it actually translates into time to some extent. So no. So how do we think when we model games, for example? What are the concepts we're using? Exactly, right? We think about the world as a collection or a coordinated collection of objects, right? We have tables, we have chairs there, we have students there. So um, all those different uh, objects with K, obviously, um, are concepts that we can work with, we can deal with because they move autonomously but are coherent in themselves, right? So uh, obviously makes sense. And that's fundamentally the difference because we don't think in pixels or polygons, right? So um, even polygons is already and a higher abstraction level for, uh, than pixels, obviously, but uh, even that one is not something we generally, genuinely think in, right? So that's something uh, that challenges us, apart from obviously performance. But this is the key idea. We need to have some mechanism that allows us to do that translation. So take 3D objects that we put in from our you know, application or by modeling them from hand, if we are uh, into design. Um, and that are actually modeled in or translated into, you know, um, well, fundamentally we provide polygons, but they are fundamentally translated into pixels under those constraints, right? So that we're thinking about, okay, it shouldn't matter what hardware we're running, shouldn't matter what operating system we're running, and so on. So um, fundamentally, that's the that's the key move we need to um, do here to work with this um, translation problem. And um, this leads us obviously to the theory we need to cover. Um, translating 3D to 2D, there's various frameworks. Do you guys any other know any other frameworks? Or to take my question back, does everyone know all those frameworks to some extent? Or some of them, perhaps? Some of them? Yep. What are they for, perhaps? Know. Anyone? Yeah, I mean, I've heard of them. <laughs> <laughs> Wh which one? Yeah, I've heard of OpenGL and Biotech. Yep, cool. Anyone here about Balkan before, Vulkan? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry? SFNL. SFNL. Okay. SFNL uses OpenGL though yeah. to display their stuff. Yeah, that's a, it's kind of a tool. Okay, maybe that's the problem here. We'll, we'll our, ourselves find us using a lot of tool sets that complement OpenGL with respect to its shortcoming, but also operating system binding. Um, we will um, see quite a bit of that. DirectX? Yeah. Uh, sorry, that was... That was uh, uh, no, if you uh, like of the different ones I've heard of, uh, yeah. I have heard of uh, Vulkan, and yeah. uh, I know it's uh, uh, well, I know it's uh, like a graphics uh, framework. Yeah. And 
from what I've heard of it, it's usually very hard to run it efficiently, but if you do run it efficiently, you can run it much faster than OpenGL. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah, so there, there's something to it. In fact, it's the yeah, latest throw at uh, graphics frameworks. The idea is really to go bare bone as low level as possible. If you, I mean, I'm careful with this analogy because it doesn't really translate directly. If you see OpenGL as the C++ of graphics programming, this one would be the assembly of it, right? So it's incredibly fast, incredibly low level, but you need to do everything from hand, right? So really involved. Um, we'll have a um, definitely talk about this, so, so so you get an impression at least of how it works, but also to discuss whether it's the future or not, because that's the important thing to look at, because it's only like one or two years old. And uh, there's obviously movement in that space, right? As to which framework is the most relevant one, especially if you are working in that space, it would be very important for you to know, okay, where do you invest my time in, right? <coughs> but um, as of now, um, OpenGL is probably the most generic of any of those frameworks because uh, it's fundamentally platform independent. It runs, as we elaborated and suffered through, uh, Linux and Windows, um, whereas DirectX, what, what about DirectX? Did anyone touch it, by the way? Windows Xbox. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fundamentally Windows technology, right? So, see, again, one of uh, Microsoft's approaches to uh, coerce everything into the Windows world, particularly in games, quite, quite, quite popular. And uh, SDL is a 2D framework that uh, integrates well with OpenGL, but um, we're probably not using it. We actually decided to do as much as possible only in OpenGL and not use um, um, 2D frameworks here. Because the idea is, if you understand OpenGL, then you can translate everything you do into 2D frameworks without any trouble. Because yeah, obviously the APIs are different, um, but um, it, it um, fundamentally shouldn't matter. So that's our idea. But again, we leave that a bit open to you, uh, whether you insist on learning some 2D um, APIs as well. We'll see you. How that goes. Um, one aspect which is generally not covered by those APIs is the fact that uh, we want to interact with them, right? Particularly if we want to write games, we just don't want to see beautiful pictures. We actually want to, you know, have influence, influence them, uh, you know, driving a car or moving a, uh, a, a player character and so on. So uh, the integration aspect is quite important as well. So how do we actually deal with input or interaction um, with a particular um, graphics framework. So, and as such, it starts with quite a lot of different disciplines. So we have computer science about uh, how to do proper programming. It's about learning APIs, how to structure, how to use APIs. In our case, this course really again about using APIs mostly, graphics APIs and such, code management uh, and professionalism in doing so. So what size commits should be, um, where they should you know, lie, um, they should, uh, how descriptive they are, and um, aspects like this, documentation. Um, we obviously need to cover oh, the, the, the graphics discipline relates to uh, mathematics as well, thinking about geometry and matrix manipulations, as I mentioned, and physics. So that's an interesting one. Um, so positioning, uh, lighting, shadows, things like that, reflections. So it's something we need to um, talk about more um, later on. But so this course will be reasonably applied. I mean, there will be maths in there, but we won't make the entire course about it. If you look on the internet, and there's quite a number of um, graphics courses online anyway, but most of them get lost in their maths, um, and that's reasonably helpful to understand the background, but fundamentally OpenGL is doing the load for you anyway, right? Because the uh, math library that comes with it, it will basically just do what we will learn about, but from then on you fundamentally rely on it to do it. So it's, there will be a limited extent to which you need to do the math really yourself. But it's super important to understand it. So, and that's the kind of emphasis <coughs> we put here. That's why we make this one a bit bigger and this one a bit smaller as opposed to making that big and that smaller as you find in many uh, advanced courses. Uh, similar in Trondheim as well, so it's a strong emphasis on that. Cool. Um, so before you all fall asleep, um, which is mm -hmm. reasonable, giving that warm summer day, um, some terminology <laughs> and we briefly talk about image formats just to get it out of our way because it's one of the things we need to talk about and it may make more sense later on uh, when we um, come back um, to that one. First of all, ter uh, terminology, some of it, you see it's open-ended because everything that comes here uh, will be uh, explored later on in different uh, lectures in a um, 
you know, sufficient context, right? So, but you guys probably have heard about um, the concept of pixels, right? So pixel is short for pixel element. You get the slides, don't worry. Um, on Texel would be the equivalent, so that's, that's on the screen basically. This would be on a texture, right? Obviously it can be offset because the texture may not correspond to the screen coordinates and so on. Um, but it may also be stretched or modified or, or you know, uh, in any other way. But fundamentally the idea is to uh, differentiate with what, what you see in the scene as opposed to what you see on a texture. Um, but oftentimes it's used con in, in, in a very same, um, very same manner. Then there's a uh, notion of sprites, which is basically just a bit map picture that is, um, um, you know, mapped to the screen. Um, Blitz, which is the concept of blitting, is uh, about copying parts of the memory um, that is associated, let's say, with one um, a graphic element over another one. So you basically can do overlays of uh, images in order to have a, you know, develop your entire complete scene. We see that in a second. And it's quite related to parallaxes, uh, which is dealing with the um, having a pseudo 3D effect in uh, which you may have seen on some websites. Did ev is everyone come? Has everyone seen parallax effects? Yes. No, uh, I could briefly go on. Yeah. Everyone yeah. has seen them in Not games sure. at least. <laughs> they just probably don't know it if they don't know if they've seen it. Yeah, okay, now we'll be briefly um, come up with, with two examples here. Um, before we yeah, before we go to um, parallaxing, um, or let, yeah, let's, let's, let's yeah. briefly okay. look into that one. I have... Um, uh, this explains everything. It actually does. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, yeah, what found the the picture. Picture. He found the best picture. I think it's the same as you had up there or something. Like yeah, yeah, fundamentally it would probably be. Yeah. And just you guys uh, may not know that, but that was in 1982. And one of the first attempts, to, or one of the most uh, prob prominent attempts, not this bit. Det går ikke. Um, to actually have some sort of 3D effects. Um, that's game is called Time Palette, but uh, it's not so much about the storyline here, yeah? but rather about the um, effect that you see. So you see precisely the product effect here. You have multiple layers, multiple images um, with you know, um, that are um, See them moving in different places, right? You have the perception that there's a 3D perspective-ish going on in the background, right? You see clouds moving over clouds, and the uh, and the world goes in front. So you have different layers, and you use the Sometimes clouds are confusing, arbitrarily, but um, so that's fundamentally the idea of um, parallel functionality. Another example which is more contemporary. I just leave that running for the sake of animation. So, is the um, GitHub error page? -ish. There you go. You see that one. You also should have some uh, parallax effects. See that one? So it's very moderate. But that's that's the kind of a more modern variant uh, as well. Same same thing. So we have two layers. How many layers do we have? Actually? Anyone, I think only two. No, three for yeah. Three. So, one, two, three. So, that fundamentally the same um, kind of approach. So, no. Alright. I know, I didn't see that. You're right. Let's just get that one. Yeah. So, I think I need to switch that off eventually. It's fairly animating. <laughs> So, uh, but fundamentally, it just um, ref ref um, reflects the idea that we have a ordering of objects from back to front, right? So first you draw a background, then you draw in, in uh, GitHub right now one of the first uh, buildings there, and then the layer of the next one, and then the foreground with this uh, um, uh, weird character in front of it, right? So, um, and 
the, the idea of blitzing comes here into play, that you basically just um, you know, over, overrides everything that's uh, in front of a given object uh, on the next, uh, um, um, you know, next higher level, if you like, the, the one that's next to you, to you. So the next layer that's towards the viewing perspective, and that's called blitzing if you override this particular memory section. Um, yeah, or uh, where it's also used is like high scores, for example, right? You have running something around the background and then you have an updated list of high scores at the same time. Um, that's the uh, key idea here. So, um, the one of the challenges or the, something that we're dealing with nowadays is that our GPUs have considerable uh, resources, right? Both in terms of memory and processing power, we know that they're growing way faster than CPUs. And I have it used for you know, non seemingly non-graphical purposes such as Bitcoin mining, or not anymore, but really uh, Ether mining, right? Ethereum mining nowadays. Oh, what's the latest thing? What are you guys doing at home? <laughs> How do you heat your flats? No? Yeah, no? Okay. <laughs> that's, that's a viable alternative. I don't know. Uh, so. Right. Um, just checking. So, so they have, have been quite powerful. But in the past, um, uh, from a programming point of view, it was quite challenging actually to deal, to deal, with, the, to deal with the memory constraints, right? So, um, Nowadays, you just reduce the level of detail of representation, but you still have 3D objects and uh, uh, you know high-res high graphics and so on, or moderate-res uh, graphics. But in the past, there were different ways of dealing with this, particular in games. And um, the, do you know any of those approaches? Yep. I was actually uh, watching a yeah. bit of behind the scenes of Valve games. Yeah. They had like tiny 3D objects which they had in the game scene with a camera pointed towards it and then rendered it on a screen in the actual room where the player ah, was moving. Clever. Right. So they basically reduced the rendering uh, or decomposed the rendering uh, um, um, processing requirements. Okay, that's interesting. Okay. Now, I was thinking simpler. So you're, again, a step too advanced to involve. Um, but no, like the classical things of side scrollers, right? So they minimize your visual perspective that you can ever have, and by basically reducing it to a 2D, 2D uh, variant, either by making the entire screen size the level, so therefore uh, implicitly reducing the resolution, right? Because uh, you know any individual element is incrementally smaller necessarily if the entire level is represented, and. Um, or simply to have the idea of uh, having a fixed um, scope and the player can move um, through the entire level, right? Either interactively or driven by uh, some sort of time requirement and so on. So, but this way you can easily define what can be discarded from the entire model, uh, from the entire um, um, screen or from the you know, a graphics model in the background. Uh, and displayed on the screen as opposed to have different perspectives where you need to still need to um, retain the entire model in your memory, even though you're only displaying parts of it, right? So, but side scrollers were a classical way of minimizing that effort because you simply can work with 2D um, graphics to do it, plus you know effects such as parallaxes, as we as we saw. Um, the key idea is always the faster you get to the point that you know you can throw out material that you don't need to render, the better, because you know obviously you don't carry that along through uh, your processing stages. Remember this long processing pipeline that we talked about in advance. The earlier you figure out what you don't need to display on the machine, the cheaper it will get the whole processing. Um, so that's one of the uh, earlier ways of uh, dealing with those. Um, so looking at those ones, what else? We have sprites, we have a color palette we need to be dealing with, of course. Um, we deal with surfaces, which is uh, um, like um, storing um, the um, screen images uh, for availability, and uh, the obviously projection elements, which is the math problem we're dealing with. Yeah, please. Uh, I know uh, Nintendo found a way of rendering sprites where yeah. you group a lot of pixels, and they have a, I think it was three color limit, so you could uh, um, like have a smaller data size by having a lot of pixels with just three colors so you could um, okay. instead of having like uh, all colors in all pixels you could only have 
a set of colors. Ah, right. Yeah. So by grouping. The, yeah. Right, right, right. Hmm? Right, right. And give so the for kind example, of Mario. Yeah. I think it was four right. of these groups. Yeah. So you had a lot of. Uh, it was like really good for optimizing sprites. Right. In the early days. That's a good point. Yeah. We should add this to the example set here. So, um, yes, so it's a good way of um, making this more effective. Right, that's right, that's right. Good idea. So, um, projection, I think as far as we got, forget about the rest, no point right now. That's all OpenGL stuff. Um, we get to that uh, next, probably next week. Um, so that would be the idea. Um, okay, before... Before um, before we kind of wrap up this for today, because we probably won't get too far, it wouldn't make sense to go too deep. Well, I just want to talk about image formats, uh, because it's uh, part of the aspects that we should be talked about, but also to emphasize um, and have a sensitivity that you guys all know what the difference between different types of image formats are. Have you guys ever encountered raster versus vector formats or talked about it in any course? This is more like recon and so on on my part right now. Either base, yeah? Uh, yeah, uh, vector, like, uh, vector forms like uh, SVG, where you define an image by, uh, uh, well, defining ve uh, vectors and saying, well, this color will uh, like have a gradient towards this direction in this shape, or, yeah. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, yep. Anyone else? I saw some, I think I saw some. Cool. Did, did you talk about it in any other course, perhaps? I don't think we did. Good. Um, so there's two types of image formats that we're dealing with, right? So, uh, and one of them is um, the classical raster formats. And that's actually does what it says. It's really oriented based on a fixed raster. So like a classical grip, grid orientation. And each of the, uh, Ideally, uh, each of the pixels is basically defined as part of the picture, right? So both in terms of color, for example, right? So either by grouping them cleverly and having different colors to, to model them, some picture and so on, or having a um, um, individual color associated with each uh, pixel and so on. Um, but fundamentally, what's the downside or what's the limitation of this model, of this approach? It can't easily be scaled. Yeah, it's right, right? So you can't easily scale it up. In fact, you, you, you can scale it up, but what's the effect that we usually have? It looks, yeah? The squares just get larger. Exactly, right? So it, all the squares just get larger and, yep. You have difficulty with complex shapes. At least if you add more pixel, it, pixels, it looks like you have an actual shape, but it's technically all just squares. Mm. Right, right, right. So because spheres yeah. and such, yeah. they look terrible. You lose a few pixels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you get you gotta get those uh, artifacts, right? I'm not yeah. good in drawing, so I'll probably li leave it at that. But uh, you're approximating a shape, and therefore, yeah, um, yeah. Anyway, um, that's right. So it becomes more visible. You're de basically dealing with artifacts, and that's as far as I should go at this stage. So that's one of the long side. But why do we? Well, if they're so crappy, why do we need to deal with those formats? Because they're very, very standard. Yes, one aspect. Yeah. That's right. That's, what's another aspect? At least on the hardware side, it's a lot easier to use just standard grids than to basically bend lines to create different lines. Yeah. So uh, from a hardware perspective, that's the only way you can represent anything. Because even the most modern technology still works based on pixels, has a fixed resolution. Yeah. And your image, sorry? Okay, and the image is fundamentally scaled to that resolution, right? So uh, it boils down, whatever you do, whichever format you take, when it's displayed, you end up with this one, yeah? So fundamentally it's broken back down uh, as part of the um, transformation process um, to do that. So the other one is, uh, as mentioned just before, is vector formats. And that's really much more along the lines of what, how we probably model and think about objects again in, in 3D uh, model, uh, yeah, modeling, but also 3D processing, right? So we have geometrical shapes, such as, you know, cubes, spheres, whatever else, um, that we model. And we actually don't want to deal with that level of technical complexity, right? So think about, okay, resolution, all that kind of stuff. That should be done by the engine for us, fundamentally, because it links our model to the hardware, to the underlying platform. So here it's really, uh, everything is based on geometrical shapes or some sort of mathematical representation as opposed to a 
specification-based um, um, representation, um, the discretized representation. So, um, so you, we are able basically to have a continuous representation that is only discretized once uh, transformed for displaying. And um, looking at the uh, raster-based um, image formats, do you know all of them or some of them? So there are some really old ones. They are called uh, PGM. Um, ah, what is that? I forgot what it's uh, what is what it stands for. PPN and BMP, the classical Windows uh, bitmap. The key thing is they, are, um, they have different features, but they're fundamentally uh, quite simple and generally uncompressed, which makes them really unattractive nowadays because they're large in size. Uh, furthermore, BMT, Microsoft has taken its usual uh, approach of kind of refining this format, you know, proprietarily because it's their format. So um, it's, it's, it, it, it's subject to changes over time. So the more independent um, formats are generally falling this uh, um, kind of two uh, categories. So we generally have uh, compressed image formats that are either lossless or uh, have lossy compression. So lossy compression implies that you actually throw away content in the process of compression, which can't be reconstructed anymore, at least not with considerable effort, or at best only approximated anyway, because gone is gone. So such as reducing, um, similar to reducing your resolution, you basically throw out content, and um, JPEG does it similarly for um, based on visual perception. We'll see that in a second. Um, but looking at the lossless compression formats, you guys know as GIFs. Mm -hmm. And if you do know them, then you only knew, know them as animations nowadays, right? So uh, does anyone still use non-animated GIFs? Yes? I, I know of non-animated GIFs, yeah. at least. It's, it's not commonly used, but I have I'm seen usually them. disappointed when I find them non-animated GIFs. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, exactly, yeah, exactly. How can you do that to us, right? So yeah, so that's a bit of a um, outdated um, theme, but they they are still um, popular in the meme sphere anyway. Right. So then um, their successor is uh, PNG Portable Networks Graphic was developed as a response to GIF actually because most of the um, codecs um, or the algorithms were proprietary, so uh, or uh, patented and so on. So there should be should have been an open solution, which it is. PNG is an ISO standard, so um, that's certainly more a more successful solution. Uh, has transparency, um, is good for compressing large uniform areas in, in, uh, um, in surfaces and so on. Then we have the text image format, which is uh, considerably larger generally in size, another alternative, and um, ultimately leading to such formats as is RAW. And those are, for example, um, camera specific. Uh, formats that really boil down uh, to the representation that's chosen by the developer or your manufacturer of your camera, right? Does any one of you shoot in RAW uh, resolution or in the RAW format when you do tech pictures? No, no? Then, then I have to ultimately convert them before I can use them for anything and that takes that's right. a long time. That's right. So that, the tricky bit here is often that people may actually, uh, uh, you know, do things in, in, in the RAW format. Yeah. At least if you want good pictures, you tend to use raw format because then you can uh, later open the file and balance lighting and such with actual lighting data and not just a yeah. predefined PNG. Yeah, that's right. So you can actually use the you know, camera parameters more or less uh, and then in order to adjust your raw image before actually then compressing it into something like JPEG or whatever else, right? The end of your uh, pipeline of uh, processing pipeline. Key thing is they are, it can varies from device to device, right? So if you have a can as opposed to a uh, Nikon device, you definitely want to keep track of the software using it. So it's not a good, it's not a really a generic yeah. format here. Um, so those are the loss, but they generally consider the lossless ones. Some of them have compression features. Um, um, but the most prominent one is obviously our lossy JPEG format. Um, but, uh, and I'll run through two of those. So just to give an example for the PGM format, it basically looks like that. That it's literally uncompressed and uh, text-based, uh, plain, um, plain text-based. And you have some sort of identifier that identifies that uh, version two of the format. It uh, identifies the width and the height. So the grid is actually specified. Um, the grayscale values it deals with. So that would be, I guess, your um, grayscale depth in a wide sense. And um, 
Yeah, then the actual payload, right? So the actual uh, name of the picture and the uh, individual uh, representations um, f or grayscale levels, basically, um, are simply encoded. So very straightforward, simple model. No one uses that anymore. Um, and, uh, and on the other end, we have something like JPEG. Any comments? No? Yes? Okay. Feel free to interrupt, just uh, be explicit so I uh, know. Um, the other one is JPEG, right? So most commonly used. Why do people, why, any idea why it's so popular? Yeah. Because it's very, very tiny. Okay, yeah, it's very, very tiny. Yeah. It, it, it compresses it a lot. Um, yeah. Uh, usually you can't really tell when it's been compressed, which I guess means it does its job pretty good. Uh, and you end up with uh, relatively small images to what you started with, which is really very fun when you're sharing them online. That's right. So, yeah, again, uh, especially in the early days of web loading is key, right? Data transmission is expensive nowadays, well, moderately, but still. So you want to have some, some good compression format, and JPEG was the first one to come out, and that's why it succeeded. It's not the best one anymore, but it's the most successful one, and I think that's why it stays around, right? So standardized in 92, if anyone is interested. Probably older than some of you, in fact. Um, <laughs> and, um, well... Yeah, my gauging is a bit off. 20-bit, 24-bit color range, uh, lossy compression, generally uh, a small file size. And the idea is there, the file format there obviously is not as transparent as the PGM format I just showed you. But um, similar idea, we have a header. And in fact, all those graphics <laughs> formats have the similar um, pattern. They have some sort of header and then some um, content. And uh, it usually involves a magic string, so you can identify what format it is from inspecting the format as opposed to the file name. Um, compression tables, quantization tables, and brightness definitions. We'll get to that in a second because that makes more sense once we talk about the compression, which is then followed by the actual image content, so the encoded content. And um, it has um, optional... Um, fields for providing application-specific data, like EXIF, EXIF information, right? What's EXIF information? No? That's the kind of stuff that saves your location, for example. Um, yeah, so it's an appendix to the original uh, JPEG format and can be um, Appended, so you can actually keep track of the location you shot your inter Instagram picture at or whatever else, right? All those things that uh, un uh, uh, reveal um, secrets. So, um, the compression steps, fundamentally, it works a bit like uh, one audio format, uh, like MP3. You guys know MP3, right? So, what does MP3 do, roughly? It reduces the like, amount of data, the data points you have. Yeah. But more, most simplistically, what are they fundamentally doing? If we think about that's the uh, yeah yeah think about this as the uh, frequencies uh, of of sound that are involved. So it helps generally. It defines points on the wave, basically. Yeah, that does it eventually. So what it does first, though, is actually chop off everything that humans can't hear in the first place. So it actually looks from a user perspective and say, hey, who is actually listening to MP3, right? Is that some sort of bat, you know, you have ultrasonic sound or something like that? No, generally in humans, uh, you know, our um, ability to hear high and low tones uh, decays over time, so we have a more narrow range. So they precisely do that. They chop those two off. Then they identify the difference between the left and right channel. And instead of storing both channels with complete information, they only store one channel plus the diff to the other channel. So this way you use massive information. And then you quantize them as well, right? So you discretize um, depending on whatever bit level you chose. Again, my <laughs> uh, ignore that. Um, so you basically quantize them based on whatever bit level you chose, right? 128K, 192, whatever else. And this way you compress massively your originally fully fledged um, uh, sound information. Um, and you know have a have a, a reduction by factor ten at least yeah so similar here so the idea here is humans have um, various perception of uh, brightness right so brightness is quite essential um, they generally leave color alone when it comes to um, 
um, uh, JPEG compression, but we'll get to that in a second. But the more important thing is brightness. And the idea is that, um, that the humans are more sensitive to moderate changes in brightness as, to, uh, as opposed to large changes. Meaning, if I'm contrasting the window to the snow outside, this contrast is very stark. And even if we get it moderately wrong, it doesn't matter. We will still get it, you know, uh, it will still be differentiatable. But nuances on the snow, for example, like shades and shadows, that's something where the human eye is actually much more particular, apparently. So, uh, and this is what the basis they basically use um, to reduce the range of brightness. So they make this rather, let's say, the frame and uh, snow representation rather coarse grain in terms of brightness levels. So reduce the nuances in, in different shades of black here, for example, um, considerably. Whereas the emphasis uh, for areas which have very uh, small variations in brightness are kept. Yeah? And then this whole thing is split into blocks, similar to the approach you mentioned before, but here a different problem. Um, so we then have uh, you know, blocks of pixels that are basically um, used um, and basically applying this to the... Uh, um, using this mechanism that I uh, just mentioned, so the different sensitivity. Key thing here, however, is that this is flexible in a sense that you can inject your own algorithm. So JPEG is not necessarily a, uh, um, you know, fixed specification as in everything is fixed, but you can actually inject uh, different uh, um, algorithms to perform that task. It also means that you can, um, JPEG doesn't, you know, uh, it's not equivalent to JPEG, but you can actually have a more efficient representation or less efficient uh, compression. So you find that different programs have different properties. That's why when you have reviews on, on which tools to use for JPEG, you find recommendation on tools because many of them have simply their own uh, 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 approaches or parameterization um, in order to achieve this. And once they identified um, the necessary levels of brightness we need to represent, then we basically have an, you know, a, uh, let's think about it like an, um, yeah, a set of those basically. And uh, the idea is that then that those are um, compressed as well. So the idea is that if you have a level of brightness let's take or let's take this black here simply a black representation and that occurs considerably um, or covers a large part of your entire ski, uh, scene or picture picture in this particular case then you want to encode that as efficiently as possible right because it occurs so often in so many different positions that you don't want to waste much uh, um, space for that representation so what they do is the so-called entropy encoding where um, the idea is that you scan over the entire picture, figure out which um, brightness levels are most represented and encode those the cheapest way possible, then look for the next frequently found ones, encode them as far as possible still in a most efficient way and so on. So the um, compression will be increasingly inefficient, more inefficient, but it doesn't matter because for the most commonly represented brightness levels, it will be very efficient, right? So that's called entropy encoding, that you actually look at the image, see what occurs most often, ex uh, compress that most efficiently, and then, you know, have decay in compression efficiency from there on, yeah? So that's what they're doing uh, next, uh, basically. So you find, again, if you have different pictures with different distributions of uh, uh, brightness and so on, you'll find interesting um, effects in terms of compression. So that's roughly how it works. Again, it's always from a human perspective, how can we trick the human brain in a wider sense, right? Because the eye is constrained as an input device, so uh, how can we work around this? And that's precisely what it does. And um, there were uh, those scary claims that JPEG is a good compression format, and it is, but obviously everything has its boundaries here, right? So um, just to, to show, you get those you guys have seen that before, you get those uh, changes in colors as you see in this shape here already, and here it's entirely pixelized, so the artifacts get too large, right? So you have, uh, with higher compression levels, you noticeably see that the blocks get too large and the variation in, in, in um, particular here of color nuances is getting too, uh, too small. Where it's still sufficient to identify the rocks here, it's not strong enough to under, uh, see the surface um, or capture the surface sufficiently. So, but yeah, on the other hand, the compression is considerable, right? So we're talking 725 kilobyte to 20 kilobyte, which is uh, uh, massive. So, um, 
Before I uh, let you go, let's wrap, wrap up on those ones as well. We have vector formants, obviously, on the other side of the spectrum. And the only one I'm going to enlighten you about is uh, the SVG um, one. So it's basically just XML with CSS, JavaScript, all the beautiful web technologies you guys love and hate, or hate, who knows. Um, and they are used basically to, to um, represent um, various elements, generally including paths. They call it path in, in SVG, which is, can be straight lines. It can be curves to define get busier curves, for example, or outlines uh, can be defined with this one. Uh, you can embed bitmaps. Mindful though, even though it's a um, vector format, the bitmaps generally are uh, raster-based, right? So if you're embedding them, you're actually having a raster-based image inside a vector-based format. So which is sometimes tricky because actually the image in, inside your seemingly vector-based format doesn't scale or has that kind of nasty effect that you have massive art. Um, since it's web technology, they can be linked or embedded, so it's quite nice, and obviously also text. Um, but as well as uh, animations, for example, or filter effects that can be applied as well. And we see them as two formats. One is called SVG. The other one is SVGZ. Why is it called this? Or what's most likely happening there? Any guesses? Compressed. Yeah, right. Zip compression, right? So, uh, and just to highlight the... Um, I'm not sure if I can convince you with that one. But this would be... Um, one of the models here. And the idea is here that literally because of uh, it's vector based, you can uh, basically, <coughs> well, you, you can uh, scale it to arbitrary sizes. And uh, the source code is fundamentally just a massive definition. Yeah, I probably reduced that again a bit. So here you see CSS definitions for um, the um, colors, uh, how rivers are defined, sea decoration, uh, the borders, uh, grid lines across the entire uh, globe. And then you have somewhere, I think it's chopped that off here, unfortunately, country-specific country definitions. So you actually see the outlines, the different... Um, doing something. Sorry? Oh, there you go. It came. <laughs> Ah, there you go. That looks way better. Um, let's, let's do something we can relate to because it's a bit involved. Um, Great Britain, I sense, is here. Countries. There you go. So. Ah. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, so, and what it fundamentally does is then specify a starting point for the outline and then all the subsequent point that the shape connects to. So basically it forms a path, right? All those um, coordinates that, it's, that, it, that it basically uh, uses. Sorry, I should um, yeah, uh, read them as coordinates. So starting coordinate, next one, next one, next one, next one. And they form one outline and then um, <coughs> no, the next path. So yeah, all the individual different shapes. And I believe that will be Netherlands if I get it right. Um, and that's basically how the entire model looks like. So it's just the definition of the um, positions and definition of whatever shape it should possibly be. It can also be a circle, for example. This must be a uh, uh, latitude representation and so on, all the different countries um, that we can find. But that's fundamentally the idea between, uh, behind SVG. So obviously in space-wise, it's really inefficient. So um, that's why SVG Z is quite popular for those things. Um, it's supported by all most major browsers, but I have the impression that support is decaying in the sense that, um, God, yeah, that's, that's one of the aspects. Uh, I think one of you alluded to the fact that there's much more processing intensity going on because obviously needs to be scaled uh, to size. Um, but there's more and more, uh, yeah, move towards, I feel, uh, proprietary formats, right? So because it's very open format and very transparent format, so there's not much way of making money out of this one. But it's a kind of a beautiful uniform um, representation, I think, uh, for, for vector-based um, systems, quite nice. Obviously, you can easily manipulate it as well. So if you, for example, text there and you want to shift it or put effects on it, that works as well. Another one I just want to show you is you can do effects as well, right? Animations. So um, as simple as that. Um, cool. So again, same thing. It's basically just um, SVG.
Cool. So. Right. Yep. Sorry. Please. Is SVG hardware accelerated in, in browsers? Right. Um, it's... Um, yeah, graphics. Card. Not really. What is... Um, no. The, the one that... Well, I'm, I'm not 100% sure of an acceleration for SVG for it. There's one for WebGL which is 3D representations in the browser. So it's native, it's kind of a JavaScript embedded OpenGL variant, and this has supo uh, support in most uh, current graphics drivers. Um, this is a good question. I don't think it's a dedicated SVG support. But we need to check that out. Um, cool. So that's basically uh, <coughs> it for now. So we have a rough understanding, okay, what is the transformation process we need to go through in, comp in graphics processing in the first place, for coming from model to 3D representation, 2D representation, with more details to come, obviously. We talked about rastering formats, briefly about compression and vector formats. So just we have an intuitive understanding. For this course here, um, I don't, mm, the course descriptor is a tad outdated. I think it will change in the next few days, in fact, because I, we specified a new one, but they still haven't updated it. So, um, there is a textbook that's possibly available. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, uh, or there are various ones, in fact, uh, by Sellers, Bright, and Hamel. Um, you, you can choose and pick yourself you like, but they're more like a reference, um, 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 how do you call it? Yeah, reference guide or book or whatever else. If you like learning by books, that may be a way to go. You can just you know, get one of those books and read it from A to Z, hopefully you get further. But there's also a tutorial-based approach, and a fairly good tutorial is Anton's OpenGL for to tutorial. It's reasonably up to date, so it has OpenGL for uh, onwards, which is fine for us because there's all the features we need. Um, the actual tutorials are available online, but I think in order to get the full description, you need to buy an ebook for six euros fifty and so on. But um, again, I wouldn't even necessarily require you to uh, get that either if you find other ways there's a lot of ways uh, or a lot of tutorials on the web in the meantime because OpenGL is so established in the market that so many people have uh, touched it there's another website which we also use to inspire some of the course content which is called opengltutorial.org and it has a very basic introduction to more advanced kind of uh, features and um, um, yeah introductions basically to, to OpenGL but those would be resources I would point to. So this is a um, fairly good one, uh, a very established one, but there are various other ones. I didn't want to list any further ones. The only thing you need to carefully watch out for, look for tutorials or something that supports OpenGL 4 onwards, yeah? Because um, syntax has changed considerably. I think perhaps someone can, no, yes? For shaders at least, right? And version two part yeah? has changed. Yeah, okay. From one to two, much the same, but after it's more pipeline. Yeah, that's shaders. right. So after 3.3.1, it's the same. Okay. But it's minor changes. Right, okay. Just need to be mindful of the shader language, which has changed over time as well, right? So just to be. Yeah. It's no like definitive standard. It's yeah. just like whatever, but it's, it's usually uh, DL. Uh, Four to two. Uh, we get there. Yeah. We get there. So anyway, keep an eye on the version to some extent. So um, yeah, most features will work in all our words, but we just want to be sure that you don't. Oh, you want to be sure that you don't code or use code that suddenly doesn't work. And you have no clue why, because it's simply using an uh, outdated uh, um, variant of uh, OpenGL code. Cool. Um, right for you. Um, for Friday, please uh, prepare your machines to some extent. The extent will be as follows. Please update your graphics driver, number one. Mm. Number two, please upgrade your graphics driver. <laughs> number three as well. So do it, because uh, it will be really the first thing that we need to look at. And you also want to figure out what OpenGL's uh, version is supported by your graphics driver. Yeah, And there's two ways of figuring it out. One of them is to use um, yeah, well, Windows doesn't have a generic way, so we basically need to look into the tools of your graphics um, driver if it shows the OpenGL version. 
Um, another variant um, is to get the OpenGL extensions viewer that apparently shows you the version. And in Linux, you use the Mesa Utils, which you already have installed, as I mentioned before. And you can just look at GLX info and just grab directly for version. You should see the supported version on your particular machine. GLX info will just spit out everything. And this was, will just filter for lines that contain the word version, which surprisingly will spit you out the OpenGL version, among other things. Yeah? So it's worthwhile for you to, to get that right. Um, apart from that, yeah, I guess your favorite IDE, plus if you use Windows, Windows Studio. I'm not sure if I want to go as far to say whatever, uh, because uh, it becomes really hard to support all that. And eventually, we'll actually cut back and uh, be in, in the ongoing weeks and automate more of those elements. But the key thing is, for Friday in particular, I want you guys to go through the pain of setting it up yourself, right? Because then you understand the full picture, as opposed to uh, not being able to figure it out on a different machine suddenly or panicking if things don't work. Yeah? Cool. Um, that's it for now. So it's all I wanted to, well, it took me considerable time. Yeah, nearly two hours. I didn't give you a break. Sorry for that. I'm not used to breaks. So, um, but I'll get there. So next time we have a break uh, again. Yes. So sorry for that. No problem. But point is the content wasn't too deep, so it probably wouldn't hurt uh, too much if you slept doing that talk. No, um, jokes aside, see you on Friday. Um, any other questions regarding content or 